brings our chaos? Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory. Who rules the nations with truth and justice? Shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Worthy, worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. you a new song this morning if that's all right it's called mercy sing it a couple of times for you during our invitation but i want you to invite you to sing along as we just sing about the mercy that the lord has bestowed upon us because of the goodness of god and the life that we have because of him so join me as we sing this this morning
If you'll remain standing with me as we read God's word this morning together. If you'll turn to John chapter 4. to start in verse 1. John chapter 4. When Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard he was making and baptizing more disciples than John, though Jesus himself was not baptizing but his disciples were, he left Judea and went again to Galilee. He had to travel through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the property that Jacob had given his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, worn out from his journey, sat down at the well. It was about noon. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Give me a drink, Jesus said to her, because his disciples had gone into town to buy food. How is that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, she asked him. For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered, if you knew the gift of God and who is saying it to you, give me a drink. You would ask him and he would give you living water. Sir, said the woman, you don't even have a bucket. And the well is deep. So where do you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and livestock. Jesus said, everyone who drinks from this water will get thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give him will never get thirsty again. In fact, the water I will give him will become a well of water springing up in him for eternal life. Sir, the woman said to him, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and come here to draw water. Go, call your husband, he told her, and come back here. I don't have a husband, she answered. You have correctly said, I don't have a husband, Jesus said. For you've had five husbands, and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. Sir, the woman replied, I see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews say that the place to worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus told her, Believe me, woman, an hour is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know because salvation is from the Jews. But an hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. Yes, the Father wants such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said to him, I know that the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Jesus told her, I, the one speaking to you, am he. Just then his disciples arrived, and they were amazed that he was talking with a woman. Yet no one said, What do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then the woman left her water jar, went into town, and told the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They left the town and made their way to him. In the meantime, the disciples kept urging him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said, I have food to eat that you do not know. The disciples said to one another, Could someone have brought him something to eat? My food is to, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, Jesus told them. Don't you say there are still four more months and then comes the harvest? Listen to what I'm telling you. Open your eyes and look at the fields because they are ready for harvest. The reaper is already receiving pay and gathering fruit for eternal life, so that the sower and the reaper can rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap what you didn't labor for. Others have labored, and you have benefited from their labor. Now my Samaritans from that town, now many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of what the woman said when she testified. He told me everything I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of what he he said. And they told the woman, we no longer believe because of what you said, since we have heard for ourselves and know that this really is the Savior of the world. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for just this opportunity that you've blessed each and every one of us with to gather this morning here in this place, to sing praises to your name, to open your word and to study its truth, to grow in knowledge and wisdom of your word, to strengthen our relationship with you. Father, I pray that we never take these opportunities for granted. 
But Lord, that we rejoice in being able to gather together with the saints. Father, I pray that you would bless the reading of your word this morning, that it wouldn't fall on deaf ears. But Father, that we would open our ears and our hearts to you this morning to hear from you, to grow in our relationship with you, and to take the things that we discuss and we learn today and apply them to our lives each and every day as we walk with you. Father, I pray that you will be with Pastor Mark as he comes now to share what you've laid on his heart for us to hear. I pray that you would give him courage and boldness to speak the truth that you've given him. And Lord, that you would use it to equip us and prepare us for the week and the task at hand of sharing the gospel with those around us. Father, help us to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit moving in our lives each and every day and to never miss an opportunity to share the truth of who you are with those around us. Thank you again for who you are and for this time that we have together. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Daniel, for reading the Word of God and helping prepare us for our time in the Word. We are in our series, Radical Impact, A Life Worth Living, and we've been studying Jesus' approach to spiritual conversation. This is the second of a three-part series in learning from Jesus how to start and sustain a spiritual conversation, which at times can be very, very challenging for us. But it's something we want to learn how to do. I want to take a moment, and Donald's over here to my left on the front row. He didn't know I was going to call him, but I want you to stand just for a second, Donald. He's got on this great shirt. Y'all see this shirt he's got on right here? See that number on the side? See that number? What is it? What's that number? A 14. People are going to ask him what that number is. And that's going to create an opportunity. You can be seated. I think we know what that shirt is. If you didn't get your shirt yet, pick it up. We will be doing other orders for those shirts, but they are tools for a testimony uh, to share the gospel. We want to have the opportunity to tell other people what Jesus has done for us. That is the entrustment that God has given to us to tell what he's done for us. And it's very simple. Uh, I think we've complicated it. Um, I think that we have so put it outside the range of what we think we're capable of that most people just never entertain it. But I think that's a lie from the enemy. Jesus said, I will always be with you when he spoke about the great commission that we are to carry out. And so when we read this in Scripture, we know it is our mission as a church to tell others of what he's done for us. And in doing that, we are obeying God and we're engaging people with truth. This is really the moving from the knowing the truth, everything I just said, I think almost all of us know that, to the living of that truth by engaging people with the gospel. There is a learning, yes, involved in it. You build bridges of communication. Listen. The disciples are learning in this text, like never before, exactly what Jesus is doing and how they should live. And when he departed from them, they were left with this mission, but they were impressed with the truth of how Jesus lived. And that's what we're doing in the text. We're allowing Jesus to impress us with how we should live in regards to interacting with those who don't know him. Now, What's interesting about our text today is that Jesus is actually going to bring up the little word sin, S-I-N. Such a small word, such a powerful word. It is one that destroys lives. It is one that separates God and man, the little word sin. And sin is a word that oftentimes we have in our culture a hard time talking with other people about, bringing it up. How do you do that in a loving way? How do you do that in an appropriate way? Oftentimes it's intimidating to us to know how to do that. We think, well, that's people's own personal business. Well, the Lord calls us to know how to do that because if we really love people, we're going to help them know how to overcome sin. I think we need to understand the spiritual dynamic that takes place when we engage in this type of ministry. In John chapter 3, I just am going to kind of lay a foundation before we jump into our next three points today. I just want to kind of lay some foundation for us to think about. In John 3, 
The very famous verse, verse 16, that says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. We must read past that. That is the truth. But we need to understand the context in which that truth was given. He goes on to say, For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world. We're not here to condemn people. He didn't come to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. And then verse 19 says, this is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but men loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Now, the reason I have read those verses to you is I want you to grapple with the fact that there is a spiritual dynamic that is taking place when we share truth with other people. Jesus is the light of the world. When we share that Jesus came to die for the sins of mankind, there is a spiritual battle that ensues for the souls of men. Men love darkness. There is this clashing between light and darkness where men have to deal with that. And there's a spiritual um, dynamic that is taking place, and we've got to be okay with that. And I think that's what we're learning as we watch Jesus interact with this woman at the well. This is spiritual. There's a lot going on in this spiritually for her and what Jesus is saying to her. It is light clashing with darkness in essence. And the light of the world is what she needed. In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4, I've learned that this is so true. It says, The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. The enemy blinds the minds of unbelievers. I've learned to pray that that they could overcome that blindness, that they would see the light, receive the light, and be set free from their sins. But even in this little verse, we see that we are bringing light into a dark world, and we are to shine this light. And I am simply saying these things to help you understand that when we engage giving the truth to other people, there's a lot going on spiritually in the midst of it all. But we must live like Jesus. We've got to build bridges relationally. We have to confront sin with truth lovingly. And we must invite people to be set free from sin and darkness and come into the light. That's what it's all about. Now, Daniel read the Scripture for us and He read it in its full context so we can be reminded of what all is going on. And last week, I want to remind you of the the seven points we looked at. I'll read these quickly. Just as a reminder, you're welcome to follow along and find these in the text. But we learned that the spiritual must first overcome the physical, meaning that Jesus, yes, was tired, hungry, and thirsty, but he set that to the side because there was something more important, the spiritual. And then we see that you've got to value all people, a Samaritan woman. Then you have to engage with purpose. As he is engaging her, he has purpose in mind. You must anticipate some skepticism. This lady was like, "Mm, who is this man talking to me and what's going on here? There is a transition to truth because that's what it's all about. Then there was the anticipation for some questions, which is understandable, And then there's the offer of spiritual truth that came in verses 13, 14, and 15. That's what we saw last week. This week, we're going to move into number 8, 9, and 10. And before we look at the next three points, I want to remind you, laying some more spiritual foundation here, that Jesus was talking to a Samaritan woman. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is simply because We must understand, we must accept, 
that when we surrender our lives to Jesus and we are following him, we forfeit our right to choose who we will love. We forfeit that right. Jesus is talking to a Samaritan woman. His disciples were baffled by this. They were really having to grapple with this. It was a lesson that they did not ever anticipate that they would ever have to learn. But we must learn it as well. I am convinced that God is waiting to pour through you. God is waiting to speak through you. God is waiting to love through you to others who may or listen may not be like you at all. In James chapter 2, verse 8 and 9, it says, If you really keep the royal law found in Scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. But if you show favoritism, you sin and are convicted by the law as law breakers. Now, the other day I was, had a chance to speak to a gentleman out here that was walking past our church, and, and we were walking along, talking for a little while and about different things and about the Lord, and he, he pointed to our church building, and he said, now that's a church that loves all people. I said, really? He said, yeah, that's a church that loves all people. And I thought to myself, you know what? What a great reputation to have. What a great reputation to have. That we love all people that are created in the image of God. No matter their, their, you know, their socioeconomics, no matter the color of their skin, no matter their age, no matter where they live, no matter anything, we say all people are created in the image of God and God loves them. Isn't that how it should be? We must not show favoritism. Why is all of this important? It's because oftentimes you and I struggle. We struggle to engage people that are not like us, but yet God brings them into our lives and we have this moment of hesitation to go, should I engage them? Should I say something? Should I, do I have time? And there's this kind of this, this internal battle oftentimes that will take place. And then if we don't engage, when God brings them our way, oftentimes we, we find ourselves grappling with guilt. I couldn't muster up enough love for that person to engage them. Here's what I want you to know. It's not about your ability to love. It's not. Our motivation for telling the world about Jesus does not come from a love for people, but from our love for Jesus first. This is critical. If you're just trying to stir up your ability to love other people somewhere, it's going to hit a point of prejudice, difference, that's going to keep you from engaging that person. It's just something in us, selfishness. Our inability to see as God sees. But when we love God with all of our heart, mind, body, soul, and strength, right? Then we're able to love our neighbor as ourselves. <laughs> I mean, as ourselves. Then something is changing. It is not us. It is something supernatural. We are not the source of meeting needs and loving people, but we are the channel that God pours through. This is why our love for God must precede our love for the lost. And if I'm truly in love with God, I'm willing to love everything God loves. And I simply open up my life to be a channel. I'm not the source. He's the source. But yes, I'm the channel. I am the ambassador. I am the one who speaks for Him. And that's where we've got to place ourselves. To say, Lord, I can't, but you can and I make myself available to you. That's really what this is about. And the reason I'm trying to lay these truths down before us this morning is because if I don't, I cannot, will not be able to do as Jesus did, and that is to confront sin lovingly. If I'm not the channel, I make myself the source what happens is I become self-righteous. 
I see myself as better even though I may engage that person and I'm more pointing out their sin than I am helping them see that Jesus can help them overcome, be forgiven of their sin. And I don't want to be self-righteous. I want to be loving in the way that I address sin like Jesus did. So with that being said, point number eight. Today, we must learn to confront sin lovingly as Jesus did. Watch in verse 16, 17, and 18. He told her, go, call your husband, and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. This is a showstopper. This is a moment of what? (laughs) What did he just say to me? How did he know that? What is going on here? But I'm telling you the tone in which he has said this and the approach that he has taken to engage her concerning this sin is done in a loving way and it had to be done. See, sin, this little word, S-I-N, it must be confronted in people's lives. We live in a day and age where sin is elevated, sin is celebrated, sin is engaged as what makes you happy, what gives you purpose, what you do. But if you talk to people and you begin to say sin is something that is harming you, sin is something that is damaging you, sin is something that you need to leave, most of us say, well, I don't know that I should do that. Really? That's an affront to our Savior Jesus because the reason Jesus died was for the sins of all men. And if we say we cannot talk about that, we cannot address that, what we're saying is we see no value in the fact that Jesus died on the cross for our sin. That he shed his blood, his perfect blood, for our sin. People are not sinless. We know from Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I found that in conversation, if asked with the pure motive, the right heart, in a loving way, there are questions that you can ask. I ask people, have you ever sinned? And I'm glad to testify to them that I have as well. I like to ask people, what does it mean to sin? Do you think sins need to be confessed? In your opinion, how can sins be forgiven? Those are four questions. There are many more that you can raise in a loving, kind way to bring sin to the surface to be talked about and dealt with. Because all have sinned. Now, we cannot, like Jesus, know every person's sin in their life. But we can know that all persons have sinned. I wouldn't know specifically if I was talking with the woman at the well that she had had five husbands. I'm not Jesus. But what I do know is this, that all men have sin. It it is a baseline. It is a reality for all men. Just think about this. What if Jesus had never confronted her sin? What would the point of the conversation be? Because he talked about living water, it would have just been some kind of farce, some kind of joke. Was he just trying to impress people that he could talk to a Samaritan woman when other people wouldn't? I mean, what would the point of the conversation be if he'd have just left it and never dealt with her sin? How about you and me? What if our sins had never been dealt with? We would have never come to the cross to receive the forgiveness that we needed to be set free. Yes, he had identified her need. She was thirsty. But now he's got to expose her problem, which is sin. And it's everyone's problem. It just manifests in different ways for her. It was trying to find the fulfillment to fill her thirst through multiple marriages, multiple men. But men could not fill her real need, a need for a Savior. What are people trying to fill their lives up with? Why are people holding on to sin, hiding sin? I'll tell you why. Because we're sinners and we like darkness, and we think it's going to do for us what we want in our flesh, but Jesus says it can't, it won't. You must be set free from sin. This is why we should not hide sin. We should not disguise sin. We should not ignore sin. We must own sin. 
if we're ever going to turn to Jesus as Savior for sin. Proverbs 28, 13 is a verse I love. It says, He who conceals his sin does not prosper, but whoever confesses and renounces them finds mercy. we got to learn to confront sin lovingly in people's life. The next point I want you to see is this. Once we do that, we have to make sure that, that we don't get sidetracked. Don't be sidetracked. Watch what happens here in 19 and 20. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you're a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. <laughs> this is so interesting. See, at this point in the conversation, she is ch- it, this whole thing has changed from this casual talk about, you know, buckets and water and all of that, right, to, to something a little more curious to now something that's incredibly challenging as he brings up her sin. And she's thinking, who is this man? How does he know my life? I guess maybe, I guess maybe he's a prophet or he knows somebody in my hometown. I'm going to go with prophet. And so I'm going to engage him on the fact that, okay, if you are a prophet, let's talk some religion. See, the Samaritans, you must understand, were part Jew, part Gentile. They're rejected by those that were fully Jewish. And so there was this division over where the right place was to worship. Was it in Jerusalem or was it on Mount Gerizim? Well, those who were Samaritan, they had set up a place of worship on the mountain in Mount Gerizim. And they said, that's the right place. Jews said, no, it's in Jerusalem. It's over here. It's over there. And so there was this raging debate about which mountain is the correct place of worship. What we need to understand is that she is moving the conversation toward religious controversy. Why is this important? Because many people will do this. When you're talking to them and you bring up about sin, I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people about Jesus and the gospel, and in the midst of the conversation, that you begin to talk about sin, they want to talk about religious controversy. See, people are more willing to talk about religious controversy than they are to talk about their personal sin. So what do you do when this happens? How do you keep from getting sidetracked? Now, I don't have a problem discovering people's religious backgrounds. I think that's taking an interest in their life. But to move and to dwell on doctrinal controversy is not healthy. So you can win arguments over doctrine and tradition, and you miss the greater need of salvation, which is tragic. See, part of the problem is if you're talking to somebody who is a religious person, they hold their tradition at the same level as truth. They see it equal. And so when you come at their tradition, you're really coming at what they consider to be truth. Now they're misled, but at the same time, you defeat their tradition, you will miss your opportunity to lead them to truth. This is why you should not focus on the intellect, but instead focus on the conscience and conviction of sin in the heart. And the bringing forth of Jesus' redemptive love for them. Don't get sidetracked in religious controversy. It's okay to acknowledge it, that people deal with it, but don't live there. Go to the truth of the cross and the resurrection. The love of God and Jesus for sin. So you got to confront sin lovingly. You you don't be sidetracked. It's going to come. But don't let it discourage you. Don't let it distract you. Keep your focus. And then thirdly, or or tenth, the tenth point, the third point, but yes, the tenth point in our our full list. Listen, guide with truth. Watch what Jesus does here. Jesus declared, believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. He wiped out both (laughs) Which one's right? Neither. How about that? You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know. And this is what's key. You can underline this. For salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshiper will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. 
God is spirit. His worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. This is such a great answer. This is such a great guide toward truth and away from controversy. The woman said, I know Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he'll explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. So she wants to debate about which mountain matters. Well, that's not the point. Jesus knew it wasn't. Don't put the focus on the wrong thing. What matters is that salvation comes from the Jews. Where does salvation come from? That must be the focus. Jesus. Which mountain produces genuine worship? The answer, God-honoring worship is in spirit and in truth. And that's what the Father's seeking. She really doesn't know how to respond to this. So she tries to go a different direction, and she says, Messiah called Christ is coming, and he'll set it all straight. I don't really know how to answer you, but I'm going to appeal to the fact that one day this will all make sense when Jesus, the Messiah, comes. And boy, is she ever going to get an answer here. He declares to her, I who speak to you am he. Can you imagine? You just got to stop and let that soak in for a second. Let that soak in. See, this is her moment of truth. This is her tipping point. No more debating. No more saying maybe somewhere in the future we'll know. No, no, guess what? Now, right here, right now, I am he who speaks to you. I am Jesus. You need to believe it or don't believe it. And guess what she does? To some of you, to your surprise, and maybe to the surprise of the disciples, she, the woman who had five husbands, and the one she's with is not her husband, guess what she does? The one who is a Samaritan, and she is a woman, and she is a sinful woman, she believes it right here, right there. She believes it. And she receives living water. Her sins are forgiven. It's an amazing point. It was her tipping point. She believed it. I had that moment in my life where I was confronted with truth through the preaching of God's Word. And I, I was called to believe or not believe as Jesus, your Savior. And guess what I did? I believed. And it changed my life. If we never talk about sin... We can never get to the point of who Jesus really was. Check this out. If you just say Jesus was a good man, you don't have to talk about sin because a good man doesn't have to go to a cross and die for sin. But if Jesus really is the Savior of the world, he did go to the cross and he did die and bore the sins of the world and he shed his blood, the whole gospel message, he was buried and he rose again, overcame death, the whole, the whole deal, right? If that is true, then sin must be brought up for sin to be taken care of by the truth of who Jesus is. And this is why she is truly, genuinely set free. Her search is over. She's no longer thirsty. She found fulfillment in Christ. Listen, th th this is why you've got, when you understand this, you've got to bring up sin in a loving way. You've got to move away from religious controversy and point to Jesus, the truth. And you've got to bring people to the point, do you believe in Jesus as Savior for your sin? That's what's going on here. John 14, 6 says, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4, 12 says, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. No other name. 1 John 5, 12 says, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's that simple. If the cross was not necessary, then Jesus' death on the cross was an absolute joke. But it was necessary. That's why Jesus came and he died on the cross for the sins of mankind. That's why he's spending time talking to this woman. That's why he said, I'm leaving and I want you to carry out the great commission until I return. That is the call of our lives as believers. 
There's no other way. Jesus is the only way. Nothing else can compare. Nothing else can forgive sin but His perfect sacrifice. Without Jesus, we are lost. That's the facts. We're helpless and hopeless. But with Christ, there's hope and forgiveness. There's new life, never to thirst again. Let the light of truth shine. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's, it, it's what it's all about. In Matthew 16, 26, it says, What good will it be of a man, for a man, if he gains the whole world, yet forfeits his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? The world has got people so wrapped up in pursuing everything the world has to offer, they're not willing to look at their soul. But we must live with soul sensitivity because people need Jesus. We know that. There's a story that was shared by a professor at Southwestern, Dr. Oscar Thompson. I want to share this story with you in closing because I think it illustrates the profound, amazing salvation we have in Jesus, but yet the simplicity of it as well that we need to grapple with. Dr. Thompson was confronted by a student one day on the campus, and he came up to me and he said, Dr. Thompson, I have got to have some help. Well, what's going on? He said, I'm, I'm, a, I'm going to have to conduct a funeral for a lost person and he said, I, I don't know how to help them. I don't know what to say for this family member that is lost. Dr. Thompson said, okay, meet me in my office, 30 minutes. I can be there, and I'll talk you through this, and we'll work on this. Young man went on to say the funeral would be for his uncle. So the student went about his way, and Dr. Thompson went about his way, and 30 minutes later, they met up in his office. And as they began to talk about his uncle's funeral, Dr. Thompson figured out that the uncle wasn't dead. He was soon to die, but he wasn't dead. He said, I thought you said he was dead. No, he's not dead yet, but he's going to be said he's developed emphysema and his lungs are collapsing. Dr. Thompson said, I'll tell you what, I've got a better idea. How about you and I claim Matthew 18, 19 for your uncle? Our Lord said, if two or three agree on earth about anything that they may ask, it shall be done for them by my Father who is in heaven. He said, what do you mean? Dr. Thompson said, let's stand between this man and hell and ask God to save him. His problem is not knowledge. His problem is conviction. He needs to realize that he's lost. You cannot convict him. That is the Holy Spirit's job. So let's ask God to engineer circumstances to bring your uncle to Christ. After we had prayed, I asked, has anyone ever confronted your uncle? Well, yes, the student said. People have asked him to come to church. No, 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 no. I said, that is not what I'm talking about. Has anyone ever sat down and said, dear friend, I want to tell you the best news that I've ever heard and just shared with him who Jesus is and what Jesus did and what it should mean to him? Has he ever been confronted with those three things? His present need, Christ's provision, and an appeal for him to accept what he's done for him. Well, he said, I, I don't know if anybody ever has. And if I do, I don't know if he'll listen. Dr. Thompson said, dear friend, isn't that his decision? What does he have to gain if he does not? And what does he have to lose if he, or what does he have to gain if he does? And what does he have to lose if he does not? He needs to be able to make the choice. Several weeks later, I saw the student in the hall. He came up to Dr. Thompson. He said, Dr. Thompson, Dr. Thompson, he said, my uncle has been saved. 
He said it was my first time, my first time I had ever shared the gospel. And guess what? He got saved. When I confronted him with the simple truth, do you know what he said to me? Dr. Thompson said, no, I don't know what he said to you. He said, this is what my uncle said. He said, you know, I never could buy all this religion bit because people would never tell me what they were talking about. And I was too proud to ask. Dr. Thompson goes on to share and he said, that's it. He said, that's it. And listen to what he says. Just talk to people in a normal voice and tell them what Jesus has done for you and can do for them. Confront them with who Jesus is, what sin is, and how God has provided for forgiveness for sin in Jesus. That's it. Talk to people in a normal voice and tell them what he's done for you and what he can do for them. And when you talk to them, tell them who Jesus is, what sin is, and how God has provided for forgiveness of sin. Is that hard to do? Why don't we speak up? Why don't we explain? Why don't we testify? This is what I believe. I believe that sometimes we try on our own strength and we will always fail because we are not the source. But if we are in love with Jesus, we're in love with God, we're in love with the Holy Spirit as we should be, and we embrace the entrustment given to us and we make ourselves a conduit, and we say, God, okay, I'm gonna, I'll tell somebody. In fact, I'll love you so much that I'll love them the way you want me to love them, and I'll help them know that there is something that can take care of their sin, and it's Jesus like it did for me. And I'll do that in a loving way. And when we do that, we enter into this spiritual um, working that takes place that we can't explain. Is that not right? It is. Because, see, light and darkness are clashing. Conviction must take place. Sin must be addressed. And that's why Jesus came, to set people free. Don't pull back when conviction comes. Don't pull back when they need to hear the love of Jesus for them, for their sin. This student says, this is the first time I ever spoke to someone. Can you imagine being a believer in Jesus Christ? Say you, say you got saved as a teenager. Say you got saved at 14. And you live from 14 to 94. And from 14 to 94... You never, ever, verbally, lovingly tell someone else what Jesus has done for you. Is that right? Can that be right? It's not for me to speak to every person, but I must believe that the Holy Spirit will guide me from 14 to 94 somewhere to speak to someone and to love them, no matter who they are, and tell them the truth. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, there's not a person in this room, not a person that's watching on TV or on the internet that's not a sinner that doesn't need a Savior. There's not a person watching. There's not a person present that will not die. For we are created and we are going to stand before our Creator one day and give an account. Lord, the world cannot fill us. They cannot satisfy us. It will always leave us thirsty. It will always leave us in darkness. God, the early church got together and they prayed and they said, Oh God, 
Give us boldness to speak about Jesus, the crucified one. That's what the church needs today, Lord. Not in a self-righteous way, but in a loving way, in a burdened way, and that people know that God loves them. For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son. And if we love you, God, we will obey. And if we love you, God, we'll make ourselves available. We love you, God. We'll be your ambassadors. We'll speak for you. In whatever arena, whatever sphere of influence you give us, we just want to make ourselves available to you. That's my prayer for the church. And for anyone that is present or watching that has never received Christ as their Savior, you can receive him right now. You can tell him, I'm a sinner. I accept that Jesus, and Jesus only, is the one who died on the cross shed his blood for my sin, was buried and rose again. And I'm believing that. You can pray that right now in this sanctuary or those watching. And if you really mean that, and you, you, you pray that by faith. The Bible says that he forgives your sin. And you're made pure. And he comes and he lives within your heart. And you're now a child of God. I know that seems so simple. But for those who are genuine in such a prayer, Jesus becomes your Savior. That's what happened for me. That's what happened for this woman at the well. That's what's happened for countless millions of people. And it can happen for you. If you'll just be honest and open and real with God and receive His Son Jesus as your Savior. So do that right now. If you're here in the sanctuary and you just prayed to receive Christ, would you slip your hand up just so I'll know how to pray for you? Okay. For those watching, you can text us, 94,000, Curtis Decision, so we'll know how to counsel you and help you in your next step in this wonderful relationship with Jesus Christ. So Lord, right now, would you stir within us to be your vessel to lovingly speak truth to people who need it. Because we love you, we love the lost. We'll speak up for your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Church, won't you stand? I want to invite you to come and pray that your life will be available as a vessel would you come and pray for lost people who are blinded that they can see the light and receive it? Do you have a lost family member? Come pray for them right now. Come pray for yourself to be available. This altar is open. If you need to come and receive Christ, come and we'll talk to you. You come as the Lord leads. With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south and east to west We dare Christ be magnified His name would burst from sea and sky And from rivers to the mountain tops We hear Christ be magnified We're singing
finds its inmost melody and every human heart its native cry then it was an enraptured in my praise we'll see Christ be magnified we'll see Just the doorway into resurrection. 